Um, I will just go ahead and get started. I need to start by just reminding everybody, uh, and I think confirming for me too, that I do not have this all figured out, right? So while we talked about these are my ideas and philosophies, uh, these are a compilation of every principal and teacher and coordinator and workshop participant that I have been able to work alongside. And you'll hear me say that a lot, work alongside, because as a leader, you have to be able to embody all the ideas that people bring to the table. So I don't have it all figured out. Uh, I'm still learning alongside with you. And so I'm just grateful for your time today, morning, afternoon, evening. What a, what a wide array of places that we have people joining from. So uh, to get started, I am, my start in IB world and in teaching was as a language and literature teacher. So I started in high school and I coached varsity sports and I loved everything about grades 11 and 12 is where I started. And I actually started as a DP teacher. Um, from there, moved down into the ninth grade and taught both ninth and 11th when our school decided to bring on NYP. So most like a lot of schools, there's an established DP program. And then we look to continue that continuum by bringing in MYP. But I also know there's a lot of schools that don't have a DP and they just look at the middle years program as that starting point from, you know, grades six through 10. So I got to kind of work my way down a little bit. Um, from there, I took on the role of a coordinator and to all my coordinators out there, shout out to you. You are amazing. Uh, I lived your world of being coordinator and a teacher at the same time, and it was not an easy task, um, but being able to have one foot in the classroom and unit planning and teaching and then being able to be that voice of a leader and a coordinator is where I got my, my start in leadership, and I loved it. Um, so from there, I was able to move into an assistant principal role. I was an assistant principal in that high school. And then eventually I had to branch out um, on my network and I went into the middle school that fed into our DP and NYP program. And so that was my experience with the sixth, seventh and eighth grade. And I loved it. I found this passion and joy for middle level education and, and middle level students. Uh, I am currently, as Chris shared, in Indianapolis, Indiana, and if I have any of my Indianapolis friends on here with me today, thank you for your support and joining with me. Uh, I am in a wonderful network, as mentioned. I'm at the Center for Inquiry Schools, my school is School 27. There are three other partner schools there, so if you have any colleagues or friends at School 2, 84, or 70, uh, the four of us are part of the Indianapolis Public School, and we are uniquely a K-8 program. I'm a pre-K-8, so I have gotten to now learn what I call the littles. So anybody on here with PYP experience, please type into the chat of your feelings of how you see PYP connecting to MYP as we talk about our stories in the classroom, because good teaching and learning is happening from elementary to middle school and high school. And just for background knowledge, I am in most of my career, I've been at a Title I school. So definitely looking at program inclusivity um, and making sure we are identifying a program that is strong for all students and all learners. So that's a little bit about me. So now let's go ahead and jump into learning some stories. So I get asked this question often, and I would love for you to type in the chat your other duties as assigned is what I call them, because I get asked a lot, did you always want to be a principal? And no, I do, do not think I did. Uh, I was a classroom teacher for 10 years before I went back to school, and I went originally for curriculum and instruction. I loved the idea of writing and planning, but then also saw the writing on the wall that I needed to make sure I had leadership qualities. And so what I wanted to be was a teacher and a leader and a coach and a tutor and all these things, instructor, scholar, educator, trainer, advisor, consultant, I mean, all these big synonyms that just make you feel so good on your resume. So I became a principal. But if you can look in your chat and validate each other and type these and give each other shout outs, here's what I actually think I do on a day to day basis. I call myself a rainmaster. I'm a lunch duty monitor. I am now in pandemic time, a hand sanitizer passer outer, very official title. I'm a fruit cup opener in lunches. I'm the band-aid fairy when the students come by my office and forget to keep going to the nurse, so they stop by me. So I now have band-aids in my drawer. I'm a referee. I'm a case conference committee attendee. Uh, I'm a report writer. I'm now a temperature taker. I'm an all night email and text reader because they never stop. They come in all the time. I'm a bathroom 
break stand in when a teacher, you know how it is, needs someone to wash their classroom while they use the restroom. So there I go. And then other duties as assigned. So I am taking this, all of this, when I'm talking about stories of being a leader, because if you want to be a leader, you have to be in the trenches. You have to be able to stand in for a teacher, know what's going on and understand the operations of your school sometimes way heavier on the bottom side of this slide than the top part of your slide. So um, Chris, I don't know if people have typed anything in there, but sometimes it's just great to start with validation. Um, does anybody have another duty as a sign that they feel oh, like arises them? Grande, it, you resonated with many people. We've yes. got advisors and teachers, counselors, a shoulder to lean on, the cheerleader, the homeroom mm -hmm. advisor, this surface as action coordinator for the MYP. We have mentor to seven students, science club member. Uh, apparently, uh, we have folks that have been guilty of even sending you texts all hours of the night, and I bet that happens in, in that context. Um, we also have a uh, stand-in parent, uh, department mm. chair, big sister, the confidant. Um, so it's a, a really interesting list that's come up in the chat window. I think you're resonating with a lot of people um, across the world about the roles that are uh, other duties to be assigned, which yes. often just kind of end up on our uh, plates as leaders in the school building. So yes, I um, absolutely love to hear a lot of counselor. I heard a lot of social emotional learning, right? A lot of ways that we need to identify totally. with students and parents there. So if you can just encompass all that, and first of all, give yourself a pat on the back. Congratulations. You, you're doing all of those things and you didn't even know. And so much of this you're doing to lead your school and your principal or your teachers and your parents and your students. So as we go on to the next couple of slides where I just kind of compiled where I think we can go to lead our learning, um, know that it, it's all of these things. So that was pretty exciting. Thanks, Chris, for sharing that list. So I have a lot on this slide and we're gonna divide it out a little bit so we can engage in conversation via the chat, but we have to talk about our vision and our mission. And so the idea that leadership is the capacity to translate vision into reality. I am confident that as a department head, teacher leader, as a assistant principal, as a coordinator, and as a principal, you have your view on leadership and you also have your view on where you want to go. I've broken it down into four areas that I believe to be an effective leader and to ensure that you are having growth in your building. Uh, these are the areas we need to focus on. So I call it shared distributive leadership, common language, approaching everything you do with a race and equity mindset, and the idea of over communication. And I'm going to share with you that as I put these four together, I'm going to be honest and humble in my journey of where I think I had great success and where I definitely in my eight years as an administrator and 18 years together as a teacher and a teacher leader had to learn and had growth opportunities that I either had to learn from the hard way or from listening to colleagues around side me. So if you're taking notes on here, you do not have to write everything down. I'm going to divide it out a little bit here as we go in. So we're going to start by talking about shared leadership. So as I share my story, I would love for you in the chat on each one to either share, ask questions that Chris can, can hit up to me later, or make sure that you um, type some validations or things that you want to share out because I want to learn from you as well. Uh, I've also included some pictures just so you can kind of see what Indianapolis, Indiana looks like and some of our learning. So the idea that you need to build a shared leadership team. When you come in in a principal seat, system principal or coordinator, whether it's a new school looking to bring an MYP or you're new to the MYP program, the strongest thing you can do is build your team around you. This takes time. So while it's my first bullet point, it's what's gonna encompass everything else that we need to do. So making sure you build a strong team around you, get to know your teachers, get to know their strengths and their areas of growth, get to know them personally. A lot of times we talk about making sure that all of our schools working together. But if you've heard a phrase before, sometimes we hear in education that 10% of the school run 100% of the operations. You can't have a successful school with 10% of your teachers doing everything. They can't coach every sport. They can't look at every unit planner. They can't be on every committee. So I encourage you to have open access to your teams. 
whether you have a leadership team, a governance team, a foundation, a committee, making sure that every year it's an open invite, right? So I've been at schools where you can only be on the leadership team if you were the department head. And I wasn't a department head. And I felt like I had a lot of good ideas to share. And I respected the idea that then I would share those with my department head, who would be the voice for me at that team at that table when they meet once a month or twice a month. But when I became principal, I didn't want it to be that way. I wanted everybody to have access. And so some years my leadership team has 12 people, sometimes it has 30 people. But those are 30 people that want to give their time to affect change. And so I appreciate their, their acknowledgement on part of our teams. The hardest part comes, and it should be easy, but is trusting your team and delegating. Not a strong point of me in my first years of being a principal. I absolutely wanted to be first one in, last one out. I wanted to be on every single team and committee. I wanted to, and not in a micromanaged way, in a way that I wanted to make sure if my name was on this, that it was being done with fidelity and integrity. And you'll hear me say those two words a lot. But if you look at the picture on the right-hand screen, um, this is during pandemic. You can see our masks. These are my team of teachers who were here over the summer last year when we first closed last March and had to have our students come pick up their materials. And so quite an operation that I was thrown into. I had never been a principal during a pandemic. And all of a sudden, all these operations of how do I communicate to parents? What do I need to do? How do we get all these things picked up? How do we organize everything? I could not have done this without the people on this team. By the time I got into the cafeteria, the team had already organized where they were going to put all the items. They had already made sure that they had set out their colored cones and that they were social distanced and that they had a route for parents. And it was my reminder that my team knows the vision and mission. And so they know what needs to be done in the right ways. And so I hope that you also would have a story to share of a time where you had to lead by taking a step back because you had allowed yourself to create that team. You know, Brandy, um, we've actually had a, a question in the chat window from Seth, um, and Seth was saying, so do you invite for an open invite for leadership team like anyone can join? I do. So I do ask that I, I, I behind the scenes ask for a two year commitment because one year is sometimes a lot of just the grading the groundwork going. And when your school improvement plan is a three to five year live document, I do want some continuity of voice on the team. However, when we also want to tap in at teachers value and resources, a leadership team might be something they want to serve on for a year or two and something from leadership that goes into our race and equity team or our social emotional learning team or our community outreach team. I, I appreciate when they want to bounce off of the leadership team and say, I think I can take my talent to the race and equity team because this is where I want it to go. And so, so I do, I obviously make sure I have equal representation of special ed and related arts and a parent and all the different levels. But I have, in the five years I've been in this building, I have about 10 staff members that have been on the leadership team with me and will continue. But I also have about, I'd say 25% that have, you know, matriculated up and down saying other teams. And if I don't have fresh voices to push me and fresh ideas, then we're not going to grow. So that, that is how I've done it in my building. Great question, Seth. Yeah, so it, it kind of leads naturally into another question that we had um, that was even just uh, pushed to us before even this webinar went out in terms of, well, it sounds like you're putting a lot of learner profile attributes into play in terms of creating this uh, shared distribution leadership. So which, which learner profile attributes do you think leaders need the most to, to embody to be mm -hmm. successful in this, in this particular remit? Yeah, good question. So uh, I, I, I don't know if this is the easy way out. And so I'm going to go with the one that comes to my mind. But as a leader, I'm going to go to thinker, right? Because I can give you my, my reason for it if you'll go with me. You always are thinking. Every time a question comes to your desk, every time an email comes to you, somebody's asking your opinion. They're asking you to make a decision. They're asking you your advice. They, they are telling you something, you know, very many times, even as a leader, you are told something by a district and you have to think about how am I going to answer? How am I disseminating this information? How am I filtering this information? And so you're constantly thinking through your vision and your mission and everything here. I would say to this group that 
ironically, then the one as a leader that I'm going to give a little shout out to here in the chat that I think is the hardest as a principal and or as a leader is to be balanced. If you're balanced, find my find me on social media and tell me your story and tell me your, your ways you found it. And I think the reason is coordinators take on so much of their teachers, teachers take on so much of their students. And so we're very good at having other people find their balance, but we're really hard ourselves making sure we find this balance. I think the more I know, the more that I've instilled trust and delegated, I have found my balance. My team has said when we will take this from start to finish, we will do the next steps or they bring something to me that um, maybe at this point we're just in our heads. And so what I'm thinking, they're actually already putting out into action. And so I do think then that my weakness of balance and my strength in thinking has um, sort of plateaued. Maybe they're both areas of strength for, for us now over the last couple of years. So appreciate that question. Let's make sure we also then have common language. So that's not anything fancy. Those are just two words, have common language. Uh, I'll share with you first, you can see this is our peace poll that we have in, uh, in the front of our building. And so on our peace poll, it says, may peace be in our schools and it's in different languages around um, the four sides of our, our poll. And I will share with you that last year we had quite a day in our building. It's just one of those days. Uh, I went back to look at my notes about this day for this slide because it was on my Twitter page. And it's one of those days where I don't think we had enough subs. I'm pretty sure we lost power. You can see that there's a rainbow. We had some storms. It was storming right at the time we were dismissing. And so we actually released school a few minutes early because some very strong storms were coming through. And somehow we walked out front like we normally do. I saw the peace poll. I said, may peace be in our schools. May peace be inside of me today. And then all of a sudden we turned to the right just as we were getting ready to get students out and this beautiful full rainbow where you can only see half of it was just shining in the park behind us. And to have the vision in the peace pole gave me that inspiration and all our teachers saw it. What you can't see over to the left is that every teacher has their camera up, you know, on their phone taking this photo. And so it roots us in the idea that common language, align all of your practices to that vision and mission. If you are rooted in the IB vision, if you have your school mission statement, make sure that all of those teams you just aligned every day approach every choice and decision based on what are your big focus areas for your school and for your students. And then you have to create a system of accountability. Again, this is not a way to micromanage. No principal went to, to school saying they wanna be a micromanager, but you have to have a system of accountability. In MYP, there are things that have to be done and there are purposes to each part of their planning. So as a coordinator and a lead teacher and a principal and assistant principal, having a seat at the table and saying, what are we going to do to hold teachers and students and parents accountable for our learning and our teaching comes in the idea that we have to monitor the system then. So how do we monitor their progress? How do we make sure we are working alongside our teachers so that they are finding their success throughout? It doesn't happen overnight. It absolutely is going to take a school year or two or three to find your rhythm and to make sure that you have built in those successes in monitoring. And I know I'm gonna throw out a word here that some people in the chat are either going to give a hallelujah to, or they might say, oh my gosh, this word, but we've got to look at data. So there's plenty of quantitative and qualitative data that you can look at to look at the success of your program and how you're aligning your practices. Some of that data is climate and culture. It's absolutely, it's absolutely just feel good. How are our teachers feeling? It's my daily check-ins with them. It's how I see them at PLC. It's what I can hear their, the questions they're asking. Others is looking at data for how well they are seeing student learning and achievement on formative and summative assessment. But if we make sure that we all come back to this peace poll and we know that the rainbow is there, great days are ahead of us. Some days are hard in a school, some days are glorious days in school. We can ensure that we're all on that same page. Yeah, you know, uh, Hakma um, was asking is, is because you're in a, a K, a pre-K through eight school, um, she asked the question if, if MYP is very much different to the PYP or along similar lines. And this common language definitely has a, a resonance in a continuum school when we as the adults 
speak in similar tones right the way through that scaffolded um, line of the programme so that the students hear that dialogue. It builds that climate and culture. Um, do you have any practices that help build that capacity in your staff? Good question. So obviously the learner profile, right? If you are at a school that is uh, PYP and MYP, if you're at an MYP and a DP, so we're going to make sure learner profile uh, in our buildings, at our CFI schools, we say our mission statement every morning on the announcements just to root ourselves in how we're going to begin our day. Uh, I then want to make sure that we are constantly recognizing best practices. So I have found that just validating, being present, right? Obviously during times where some of us are still remote and that we are not able to be in face-to-face -face learning. So maybe we're just popping in on Zoom or Teams meetings, but being present and having a dialogue about what they're learning. Asking students what they're learning and asking them and having conversations about inquiry. It's okay if they don't say the words key concept, they don't tell me related concepts, but I very often as I ask students and it, it's framed with my language, right? So instead of saying, what are you doing today? I used to ask that. I would go into classes and I'd say, students, can you tell me what you're doing today? And they'd be like this, you know, and they point to something. I'm like, oh, that was a bad question, right? So now I say, what are you inquiring about? Or what are you studying? And they are very easily able to tell me, we're inquiring about the way our city is organized. or we're inquiring about the ways that we need to make change or affect here. And then from there, I just listen. And I, I you know, the teachers are always kind of listening to see if the kids asking or telling the principal the right thing, um, but they are, they're always sharing what they're doing. And so I would just say to be present and to know um, open-ended questions to ask your students and your and your staff. So, um, Chad, um, yeah, the, I mean, Chad has leveraged, has leaned into that as well uh, in terms of a question about determining what data is important to obtain. Uh, he says some data needs to be more qualitative. Uh, how do you devise those systems for obtaining that kind of data? Um, sure. What sort of stories do you have there? Absolutely. So we have all the types of quantitative data. So I agree, Chad, we can look at state testing, we can look at assessments, we can look at attendance, we can look at all the systems that are just kind of wrote for us. Uh, right now in our building, we are using uh, simply Google Forms to do SEL check in with staff and asking them questions um, to identify what their social emotional learning state is, what areas do they need support with. Um, I found that asking teachers the simple question of what do you want me to know today has completely opened up the door because not one of those questions or not one of the answers to those questions has ever been about their work in the building as a teacher. It has always been personal. And I didn't lay it out that way. I thought they might say, I want you to know I didn't get to chapter two. I want you to know that I need help with key concepts, but it has always been a qualitative measure about themselves as a learner or themselves as a teacher. It allows me to be a better principal to tap into what they are needing personally to go into their building. We also are doing a screener for our students on their social emotional learning and their capacities for how well they are learning as they are getting older. Um, and I can share more with you, Chris, about that later to put into the chat. But I think the benefits of us seeing climate and culture and how students are feeling, what students can say they need, connections they have with the teachers has actually during this pandemic time, because we've been remote for a good amount of the time, um, has allowed us to make stronger personal connections that is now making stronger academic connections because of our personal ties to our students and I think to each other as colleagues. And that is not something I would have anticipated, nor is there any book that I could have read to be prepared for that. So that's just me being in the hot seat and, and learning as we go. And actually, yeah, it leads to a, a question that's that's popped up. Would, would you have a book recommendation for creating that book, common language or something so, that you might want to tap into? Yeah, actually, I'm going to hit to the, the next slide. Well, actually, okay, let me go into this slide and I'll share my book recommendation. Actually, um, a book that I recommend often that might come out of left field to you because I know a lot of people on this call and chat uh, read leadership books and so forth. But one book that I go back to yearly that is on my bookshelf in my office is called The New Gold Standard. And it's actually the success story of the Ritz-Carlton hotel chain. 
Um, and I know that you might be saying, what, what is your connection here? But it is all about guest services. It is all about hospitality. And I believe that if you don't see that school settings are about guest service and hospitality, you, you're missed the boat. So I, I'm glad you're here today to, to hear about this. But every student that comes in, every person that comes into our building, we call our guests. Uh, we have guest teachers. We have guest you know, parents that are coming in. And it is our job to serve them. And it's our job to make sure that what they are doing, um, they have the highest mark from the minute they walk into, the, from the minute they see the outside, right, and the optics of our building, from the minute they have an interaction with our secretary in the front office, from the minute they see, um, what's being you know refurbished in our building and how we're making something better that is our constant our constant need and so when you find a a entity and a business and and schools in essence are a business that are run and you see someone that has been successful there's so much there are five key factors in that book that remind you that we are in the people industry and absolutely we are in the people industry and so from there just tapping in and i sometimes think reading something from a different industry um, outside of the educational jargon is easy for us to make connections so do check that out it's called the new gold standard and i, I think it's called the ritz carlton guest service um, part of it. It's the white and blue cover. Pretty, pretty amazing. Actually, I've just popped a, a link so that you can right. see what it looks like into the chat window. I think that's a really great point to note that we, we are in the people industry and 99.9% and .9 of everything we do every day is all about relationships. And I'm, I'm really interested in the next slide, Brandy, in terms of race and equity mindset, because that is a relationship that in our context for right now in the United States, but across the world, this is a big question. It is. Uh, I'm very proud to work not only in a school, but in a district that has taken race and equity as the cornerstone and the key component of our everyday work. And so uh, race and equity, these are some of our uh, pictures that last February, we during our Black History Month here, our students each were studying specific uh, people within Black History celebrations, and they decided to do a door decorating contest, which was amazing because normally we have done that for other holidays or activities, but this is the first time we focused on a person to be the vision. And so I wish I could have put 20 pictures on here because they turned out amazing. And you can see just a few samples that I put here, the collaboration it took for students to work together to make these displays was pretty amazing. Uh, please with your common language as you are making sure you have set out your teams and you have common language and vision every decision you make should be to empower and educate all students in your building making sure that we eliminate opportunity gaps and making sure that we have open dialogue this bullet point is the most important point for me as an educator and a leader who has worked in different cities and worked with different student populations that we have open dialogue about our own possible implicit bias. Where am I bringing to the table in an area where education is all about relationships, making sure that every student is feeling heard, that every parent knows that when they send their child to this building that they are safe and that they are loved? Where might I have a bias based on my own experience? And I don't even know I have it until it presents itself and I give words to what I'm feeling and I can talk with my team about how I may or may not have reacted to something, how I may or may not have made a decision, what I brought to the table when I was making that decision, which is why going back to that first slide, bringing everybody who wants to be at that table there, because then they can always push on you to be better. A big big conversation that we are having across all areas in education right now is the difference between equitable and equal. And so I encourage you when your team, when you are looking at creating MYP units of study, when you are making decision on your staffing, when you are making decisions based on, on activities that you want to do in your building, when you are looking at sports or clubs you want to offer, everything should be about being equitable. How would student A have open access to everything I have to offer in my building similar to student B. And we know right now that there is not equitable home life, there's not equitable funding, there's not equitable time, there's not equitable support. So what is our job for the nine to five or eight to four or seven to three hours that students are in our building? And when you approach your decisions from a race and equity mindset, and you start to think about what are the 
biggest gaps, it allows you and your team to start making sure that every decision you make is made for best students. And also in an IB school, where we are now looking at key and related concepts to make sure we are teaching a global issue in a local scale, it really opens up that dialogue to make sure that we understand that other people with their differences can be right. It opens up dialogue to make sure that we are approaching our literature and our study from a broad range of genres and, and studies and authors and so forth. And that doesn't happen in non-IB schools on purpose. If it's happening, it's because you have a good leader or you have teachers that are dedicated, but at an IB school, it's the expectation. And it's absolutely what will set you apart. And it's why parents will choose your school. And it's where you want to leverage parents to be able to talk to other parents about this slide and why this school is preparing students for the real world. That's really a, a, a massive point in terms of, of creating this race and equity mindset. And I, it's a it's a global, even from my home country, it is a, a global conversation to have. So what, one of the questions that's come in would, would line to that. Is this one of your biggest challenges or is there another big challenge that you have? Maybe the next slide will reveal your biggest challenges or? Yeah, um, let me think, let's see, biggest challenge. Well, yeah, let, let's go here. Let's talk about communicate and I'll circle back to that, that question. So I'm glad that that came up. Uh, as I wrap up the, the ways to be successful, over communicating was an area that I was not strong at. I think I'm a very strong communicator, but I realized my first couple of years in the building, there are so many different stakeholders to communicate to. And sometimes I did it in isolation. So for example, um, you can see here on the slide, this is actually outside of my home last spring where my daughters and I decided to write kindness messages and over communicate to everybody that was out walking that was suddenly home um, and quarantined during pandemic. Pandemic. And so we actually went to all our neighbors and just wrote tons of, of messages for people to walk by. And it was really funny because then people started walking in the grass. They didn't want to walk on, on our messages, but I found them stopping and taking photos. And I thought, when do, when do I share out a message with my neighbors? When besides maybe waving to them? So, you know, it took a pandemic and some shock to over communicate um, my feelings and my, my wishes to, to my neighbors. But I, on our social media page, started taking photos at staff meetings. And I would post that to parents and say, at our staff meeting, we just had a race and equity dialogue, or we just went through a case study, or here are our teachers planning the next MYP unit. I never showed parents that behind the scenes opportunities because I didn't think they really cared that we were at a staff meeting, like that's just our job. But the more I started posting pictures of the staff meeting, and telling parents, hey, do you know that our teachers come in 50 to 75 minutes early every week and that they are using time to collaborate and plan, right? Like they don't, they just think we're, we're teachers. So what do we do? So having to show parents what teachers do, um, one of the biggest lights we ever got on our page was in the summer when I took a picture of all of the furniture that's out in the middle of the hallway and taking everything out of the cafeteria and just saying, here are our custodians hard at work, all three of them that we have for the entire building that takes two and a half months to clean. Parents were like, wow, you know, that's what's happening. And so that's beyond unit planning and lesson planning, but that's celebrating and making sure that every person knows all of the moving parts, everything that takes place to have that school happen. Because if I don't have a clean building, we can't sit on the floor and inquire. We can't be moving around and talking with our students and our, um, and our thought partners. And so it's just this way of communicating to parents every decision that's being made, showing uh, teachers why you make these decisions, and then last, celebrating successes. I and someone that can go from zero to 100 in about 12 seconds. I am ready to like read something and implement it tomorrow. And I've had to really take a step back and understand that first I need to get feedback, I need to ask questions, and then I celebrate all of the small steps along the way because in order to get to the big, to celebrate the big, we had to hit the small steps. And this was my biggest humble area of growth as a leader when I just thought as a teacher, if a principal asked me to do something, I just did it. Like, sure, I'll do what I need to do and we move on. Um, and then I didn't realize that when I took the principal seat, 
that I needed to make sure that I shared why I wanted you to do something, how I want you to do something. And then I lifted you up when, when that really worked well for us as the whole, and that, you know, we're, our greatest value is all of our, our individual parts. It seems that this has resonated really uh, soundly with our audience, Brandi. Um, we've got several questions in the open chat, um, just even about this communication side of the house. David Lawrence was thinking about that communication between the PYP and the MYP, and he was asking, have you tried aligning the transdisciplinary themes from the PYP in those global contexts to the yes. MYP? Yes. How, how does that look in your school? Yeah, so we actually um, benefit. So, and this was new to me. So great question, because this is me, right, for all my years of experience. And as I call them the littles, I have never been an elementary teacher. And so I was still rooted in, I taught language and literature, whether it was in grades eight through high school. And I go into a PYP classroom and these, these amazing educators are teaching every subject area and plus all those other duties as assigned plus more. So shout out to PYP educators across the world, you're amazing. Uh, so in our building, the ability for our PLCs to connect what are our PYP themes and what are MYP and to have those conversations, it has actually made our, our MYP teachers a little bit stronger because they now know what is coming up from their elementary. And so they can tap into it. It's, it's just a different benefit in a K-8 building when we have the students pre-K for nine possible years. And so it's really easy for that fifth grade teacher to say, well, I remember in third grade when you did how the world works unit or you did your big economic unit. And it's very nice when our seventh grade teachers can correlate that and say, well, in fifth grade, when you did your you know, showcase or you did your learning, um, and, and this unit, now we're going to cross-reference it here. And of course, in middle school, when you can, you know, Jedi mind trick students to understand that all their teachers talk about them in a positive way and they know they're learning and we're all in it together, they're kind of like, whoa, you know, seriously, like you, you know, seventh grade INS teacher that my third grade teacher did this and, and it's yes, the answer is yes. I will also share a small thing that I learned, I inherited from my CFI family when I came, because it was already done before me, um, is something called Book Buddies. We have our middle school students um, go down. They are assigned, obviously, right now. We are not able to do this during our pandemic, but we're hoping for next year for, for mixing our cohorts. But our middle school students go down into an elementary classroom, and once a week, they read to the students, and they talk about their subjects that they're studying, and they share with them what they are going to be doing in their learning. And so when you see a group of sixth graders in with second graders um, and those sixth graders come back to me and say, well, they weren't listening or they were moving around a lot while I was trying to read to them. I just kind of give them my really good principal face and wait time. And I say, really? Hmm, how'd that make you feel? You know, wow. And they say, oh, I know what you're doing. You know, sure, I do that sometimes too in my class. So I love the cultural aspect of that as well. Um, but being able to see that those seventh graders are helping the second graders and they are remembering their work that they did in that class for some of those units or their lessons. And then when those second graders come up into a seventh grade classroom, because then we try to reciprocate, right? So seventh graders are doing a presentation in their class and they invite the second grade buddy to watch their presentation, uh, it has really developed this cohesive feel amongst the PYP and MYP that my learning continues. And so the students and the teachers get to be in each other's classrooms, seeing what learning is happening. So we're not so siloed or only in um, rooted in our discipline or in our area of study, which has been really wonderful. You know, selfishly, I get to go into all classrooms and see that learning. Uh, but unless you come up with a system or a release program or an opportunity to allow grade two into grade um, seven, or if you're an MYP school at just six, eight, do you have a system where your sixth grade arts teacher is able to get in and see the sixth grade PE teacher or the sixth grade lane and lit teacher just to watch for a little bit and see how that learning and how they're using their key concepts in their classroom um, to, to exhibit learning and what you can take back. So love for you to think about ways that you can creatively give that gift of time to teachers to further their learning. The last slide, Chris, if it's okay that I go into, and then I know we can open it up, is I wanted to end on the idea of how do you tell your story then? So we have these four big ideas of ways to make sure that we are pushing our building to be the best and that we are pushing our teachers and ourselves as leaders. So oftentimes 
I hear a lot when I'm traveling or working with teachers, these, these four red X's. And full disclosure, I have been in all of them as a teacher and as a leader. You have new leadership in your building. New leadership often sometimes happens for positive reasons. Your assistant principal promotes out to a principal. A very successful principal is picked to become an area superintendent and carry on the work in that district. So new leadership, if you created a pipeline in your building is a blessing. You, you should want people to continue to move up and move on. Staff turnover is difficult. It is absolutely a big challenge. So let me call it out for what it is. When you train a teacher or you have a great teacher who suddenly their spouse gets relocated re, um, or they have to move or they need to take a, a leave of absence to take care of their family or for whatever various reasons they have to leave or, or it's something difficult as far as a budget cut, it's difficult. Staff turnover is hard. If there's new curriculum that is pushed to you from your district or pushed you from your principal, it's easy to take that mindset when we are in a fear of change mindset and we are not feeling safe and comfortable and we are making excuses and we are lacking our self-confidence in that fear continuum, that new curriculum can be difficult. And then changes to PLC, because those of you guys who have implemented your program or you're going through candidacy, you now realize that horizontal and vertical planning and common planning time is difficult. But if we could frame our narrative and have a growth mindset, which is what we educate our students to do at all times. And if we can please remind ourselves as adults that that new leadership is an opportunity to educate and inspire. I can't tell you the number of times as a coordinator, I had a new principal. The number of times as a principal, I have a new area superintendent or superintendent or someone in charge of curriculum or instruction. I take every opportunity I have to go into the green check mark and say, okay, Come, come on my side, come sit with me. Let me tell you what we do and how we do it because I am confident that my passion will, will carry over into your passion and inspire you. I'm stuck if I stay over in the, the red X and I just am stuck in my fear of change of new leadership. When you have staff turnover, train the trainer model, right? If you cannot do this by yourself. It cannot as a coordinator or lead teacher or principal sit on your shoulders. So as you have developed those teams and delegated out, when staff turns over, who do you go to in your building and say, you know what, so-and-so has moved or I've had to move them to a different grade level. So now you're having a new staff member at your grade level. Can you please, and you start setting up the coaching cycle that doesn't have to come from you, but should come from somebody else in your building. And new curriculum is a purposeful review of sequence. It's an opportunity, right? I say the word a lot. I use my effective smile and wait time. And I say it's an opportunity in an Ivy World School because if I have new curriculum or a new mandate that's pushed to me that I need to do in tandem with Ivy, then this is a purposeful reflection time for me to say, what is it that's being asked? What is it that I know? And how do I move forward putting it together? And then that goes back up to the first part to educate and inspire, to do it with a positive mindset for sustainability. And changes to PLC is just structured collaboration, right? It's a chance for us to say, okay, teachers and principals, and it's all about our language. It's all about how we present something. So here's a change that's happening, right? But the minute we say change, we go into fear, comfort, learning zone, growth zone, all the things. So how is this an opportunity for me to provide a structure for you in order to collaborate? When, if, and when your building is all in the green check mark, and you'll go back and forth. I, I, I'm a realist. I live it every day. There are days where sometimes we live in this little red X mark and, oh, this is hard and this is difficult. But when your mindset is what's best for students, what's best for me as an educator, and I can come to my colleagues who are all like minded in this green check box, your story and narrative will be a success. And that is my wish and my hope and my dream for all of you. And then for you to share it out. The last part you have to do, sometimes we can feel alone in IB world, right? If you're the only school in your city, you're the only school in your district. Um, but here we have everyone on this call from all over the world saying, I, I'm more alike than not. This is what I'm going through. So share it with your colleagues and allow them to bounce ideas off of you. And you've resonated with so many folks. The, the questions that are coming in. Um, I, even going back to the the point about over communicating so chad wants to know what's your favorite ways to over communicate with your faculty um something that um sometimes when we you leverage and lean in and email so much yeah yes. um, it can get overwhelming so how, how do you cope with that brandy 
So I have found um, that sometimes little um, tasks can do. I, I am old school, so I am someone that writes five handwritten notes. Uh, snail mail became my friend during our pandemic, um, mailing handwritten cards to staff, putting a handwritten card on their desk, walking by them and saying hello to them. Uh, it's all that relationship building, getting to know who they are as a person so that they want to be on my team and work alongside me as an educator. Um, and then fun little things. Uh, I'm a competitive person. You heard me say that I coached four sports. So I sort of like winning. Um, I like being someone who can get to get to an end result of something. So um, my team, I think, is adjusted to that. So I do a lot of cute little, I say cute. Sometimes I, I think they think they're cute by their participation. But during my weekly notes, we might put out a little challenge. We might do a little scavenger hunt. It might be a little create your own meme. Um, one of the favorite things they did was I asked them, tell me a meme that would explain, text me a meme of how you're feeling. Um, I blew up, right? Teachers sent me eight memes that they thought. And so just little ways to communicate with them who you are as a person is important to me. Who you are as an educator is who I want to sit alongside. And then to, to be honest, Chad, I just thought about this as I'm saying it. I had to learn to share back out. That has been a very big thing for me in this role of my humble and my humility or my line of, of principal and student I don't or, or teacher. I don't like to do it in this way. But if I'm asking them to send a meme of how they're feeling in order for them to trust me or get to know me, I sent them a meme of how I was feeling. And sometimes it was like, I'm under the water. Like I, I can't swim right now. Like I am really tough, having a tough time. And my social worker was so proud of me for that vulnerability. But if you, if you want it or you need it of your staff, you have to give it as well. And to me that it, took longer than I wish to have learned that, but I think it's why um, I'm seeing the success that I, I'm feeling now with my staff. Uh, those personal notes are just an amazing thing to get, especially when they're that handwritten with care sort mm -hmm. of uh, idea as well. And certainly anytime I've passed a handwritten note, um, it, it just, it comes back in spades because folk feel that, that love and, and that's the human connection and the relationship as well. Um, it seems uh, that you've inspired many people uh, on the call as well. I have Asma has uh, asked a question. So what's something to keep in mind if you're shifting from teaching MYP, a uh, former MYP teacher, have you got some advice for the shift? It sounds like Asma's got some um, uh, moves ahead of her. What are sure. some advice for, you, for her? Yeah. Um, I think that goes back to this idea of staff buy-in. So one of the things to recognize is you um, remember your journey, right? So you were a teacher and you went through your feelings. I think sometimes it's easy for us as leaders to think that when we started this process as teachers, we were amazing. We were like the best teacher ever and that we absolutely um, never hit any roadblocks. And I do, I can, I can look back at my history with rose colored glasses and say, oh yeah, I remember when my principal said we were going MYP and I just jumped right in. I think if I took a minute, I could tell you that if you called my principal, he might say, no, you remember that time you asked all those questions at the staff meeting or, you know, and I'd be like, no, yeah, I forgot. So I think remembering that um, it's okay that there were challenges and that you have to re recognize that the people you're leading do not all think like you, operate like you, or work at the same speed, and that that's an okay thing. And so then what you need to do is decide how you're going to give them the gift of time. How will you work alongside this teacher that needs that more time? How will you recognize the teacher that is cruising and doing great and elevate them to be able to do more and to do um, to tap in? And then the best part of it is who do you tap into that teacher that's sometimes overlooked? You have the teacher that's struggling mm -hmm. and you give them a lot of time. You have the teachers that are amazing and you just let them run with it. But where is that teacher in the middle that doesn't really ask for your help and is probably doing okay, but if you don't tap into them in the success, you're never going to have someone else to lead part of your team. So find that middle teacher that maybe you just let cruise because they're doing okay and charge yourself personally to say, that's the teacher this semester quarter I'm going to create a better relationship with or get to know or coach up because you don't want them to just be in the middle. I love that idea of coaching up because it's almost like being the middle child syndrome, the, the yes. kid that gets, it's almost the kid that, you know, the oldest one, well, by the time you get to the youngest one, they're spoiled, you know, and the Absolutely. middle child is just so, it, it's, a, it's a great 
um, idea in terms of, of looking to see where folks' hidden talents are at. Uh, another mm -hmm. question that kind of popped up was then uh, on the opposite end of the spectrum, how do you get buy-in from your mm -hmm. faculty if they're, you know, you might have a new member of faculty that joins and they're maybe not uh, sure. so aligned with the program as they might like. Or how, what are some of the strategies and yeah. stories that you have about that? If you have, so you're going to, this is going to be approached two ways. So if you have the benefit of hiring, right, because sometimes you go in and you, you inherit, right? So if you are, this is just my little plug to make sure you hire hard. Any advice I would give to a principal would be to right now, review your interview questions and make sure that they are difficult. Like, and I say that very nice. Uh, if you did not write your interview questions, if they are interview questions you've used for the last five or six years, identify what needs you have in your building, what challenges you currently have and redo your interview questions to make sure that the person you're bringing in is an asset to the team that you need right now. And so again, benefit of working in IB World School is added value and you need to make sure you find that teacher because the person that you hire is the most public decision you make. You are putting your name on that person to be a colleague and to for parents to understand who you're putting from their child, so hire hard. If and when you are inheriting teachers, right? So you become a principal or this is just the staff you have as you're moving forward. It is making sure that you have the mindset and you are straightforward with your communications. As principal, these are my expectations. This is my clear vision of where I want to go in actionable, sizable steps. And I'm alongside you every step of the way. So as an English teacher, when I sat with a Lane and Lit teacher um, to do a unit planner, I could knock it out in two seconds. When I sat with my math or science teacher, it took me an hour and I was on it. Like I need more time. I don't, I don't have the background you do, but I have other knowledge. How can I help you? And so taking that time to work alongside them and, and understand that I'm in the trenches with you as a leader is very important. Uh, I, I think you might have touched on a uh, part of the um, final you might have touched on part of the final idea here um, mm -hmm. uh, that Chad has shared with us um, in terms of how you move between the buy-in and the non-negotiables. Um, so just as we wrap up nearly at the top of the hour, um, what's your, your last thoughts about how shared leadership might be a buy-in, but race and equity might be non-negotiable? So that's where his question kind of lies. You've talked a little bit to that. Yeah. But how do you move between that buy-in and non-negotiables? Um, I'm with firm, with firm dialogue and expectation. So if you go back to that open communication and that direct line and you say, this is what's best for all students, um, I'm going to be very bold right here with my audience and say that while I talked about coaching up at times, there might be times that you need to also coach out. Where if a teacher at all the times you have aligned and said, here's my shared leadership opportunities, here's times where your voice can be heard at this table, here are areas in which I approached you and supported you, here are the resources, here is the, the budget that I've provided for you to have additional training or support, here's why I will sit with you. Inevitably, if the tough conversation is, where do you feel that you cannot be successful or where do you feel you need more support? I will be honest with you as a principal, if I, if I can or cannot meet your need, and if I can meet your need or I find that common ground, I will give you everything I have to move forward. But if ultimately it is not what's best for students and this is our little hiccup, then this is a time for us to decide where do we, where do we move on because my responsibility is a successful IB program for all students. And so I just thank you guys for your time today and your honest open questions to say, being a principal is vulnerable. Being a principal is a lot about um, what do I need to do? How do I lead it? And always wanting to make sure you do it right. You're not going to. Some days you're not going to do it all right. Other days you're going to be an amazing rock star. And so whether it's through other Toddle uh, webinars, whether I know you guys are very active on chats, on, on social media. So finding ways to connect with each other on social media and sharing our stories is the only way we can make sure that we are all successful by sharing. 
Randy, thank you so much. Your stories from the classroom, as I said in the beginning, will inspire. And I've already got many folk in the chat window want the, the recording. This will be available for you. Just let us know um, at Toddle, and we will make sure that these recordings are here for you to, to distribute to your leadership team. Um, on behalf of all the team at Toddle, on behalf of Brandy, thank you very much for joining us this morning, this evening, this afternoon, wherever you are in the world. Um, we've been delighted to have your company to learn from each other and join us on our learning journey as we continue this series uh, by MYP and learning stories from the classroom. Thank you very much. Thank you all. It was a pleasure.